I think it's critical to our science to make sure that those with different backgrounds are available at the table to help us address some of the very challenging, complex issues that are behavioral medicine, behavioral science. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Buzz and Behavioral Medicine. Today, I get the honor and privilege of talking with Dr. Monica Baskin. Dr. Baskin has been a leader in transforming community-based participatory research. Her efforts to improve behavioral medicine can be felt in her guidance in advancing diversity, equity, and inclusion within our organization and the others in which she has worked. In this episode, you're going to hear about Dr. Baskin's life journey and some of the challenges and grief that really helped shape her into the passionate and thoughtful scholar and leader that she has become today. Join me as we learn more about the life and work of our treasured leader, Dr. Monica Baskin. Well, thank you very much for joining us today, Monica. It's great to uh, see you and, and, and hear from you today. A lot of what we're doing in our podcast is learning more about our leaders in the field and their personal and professional journey into behavioral medicine. And I read from your bio that you um, received your bachelor's degree in, in psychology um, at Emory University. What a great school. It's a small college, right? Small private university, very competitive. That must have been a great opportunity. And, and you know, tell us a little bit about what led up to your success in, in you know, entering Emory? Well, first, I'm so excited to be here and talk a little bit about my experience and definitely appreciate um, you inviting me for this. Um, in terms of Emory, so I'm a native of Atlanta, Georgia, so I always grew up knowing about the university and all of its contributions um, to the city and to the, and to the world. Um, but, you know, I think my selection of Emory wasn't exactly my first choice. Um, I had a great experience my junior year of high school, I was invited to a summer program that was targeting um, students who were underrepresented and, you know, really focused on math and science as a way to encourage people to go into the STEM um, fields for their undergraduate career. So I, um, the, my junior year in high school, went to that program, had a great time, loved the campus, um, and, you know, really got excited about it. However, there was another institution that, that had my eye. I, um, as a first choice. But unfortunately, that same year, my junior year in high school, my father was diagnosed with colorectal cancer. And um, he also was a long-term time Atlanta native, um, really, um, really focused a lot on education. My older sister and I never had a question about whether or not we were getting a higher education. It was just where we were going to go. Um, but fast forward, my father um, succumbed to um, his stage four um, colorectal cancer in the fall of my senior year in high school. And as a result, there were a lot of challenges within my 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 family, um, particularly my mother had a hard time with the loss of my dad and then the potential loss of me going away to school. And so made the decision to stay closer to home. And, you know, because I knew Emory's reputation and have been there, you know, it felt really, you know, comfortable to be able to stay. And it didn't hurt that a guy that I was dating from high school was also <laughs> going to stay in Atlanta <laughs> to go to college. So um, it, it sort of made the choice made itself. So yeah. that's how I ended up there. Well, that's interesting. Um, and, you know, it's very important to be close to family. And, and you know, it's 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 hard when someone in your family is going through something like that. And we can talk a little bit about that because I know you have a, a worked in cancer research and cancer prevention. I'm sure that having that early experience with someone who's close to you um, having cancer might have informed what your choices and career path. But before we get there, let's, you mentioned the love of learning. Where did that come from? Yeah, I think, you know, my, both my parents and my oldest sister always talked about me being inquisitive as a child. Uh, one of my favorite pastimes is still doing jigsaw puzzles and, and trying to figure out things and how they work. So I think that was always um, important. Uh, we also, growing up, we had lots of books and, you know, around. Um, it was very important that for my family that every year we went and traveled um, to outside of, you know, Atlanta and, and outside of the state to go to different places to get exposed to different experiences, to learn from 
from people to go to um, cultural events and so forth. So that's how I grew up. Um, and Atlanta is an amazing place, very rich with a lot of history, obviously, um, a lot of cultural experiences. And so I definitely benefited from that. And especially growing up as an African-American young woman, you know, being able to see people that look like me um, in all of those spaces, in spaces of leadership within the city, um, you know, being able to see them in higher institutions, all of those things, I think, played a role into um, the desire for learning, for higher learning. And then my father's journey itself was very challenging. Um, So growing up in rural Alabama um, to parents who um, didn't have a lot of financial means um, and had multiple children, you know, it was still you know, part of his upbringing, that education was sort of the way to level the playing field. So, you know, despite that background, going through obviously racism, discrimination, um, segregated schools, um, and even some early health issues as a as a young man, um, he was still able to move forward and and graduated from Morehouse um, College in in Atlanta as well. So, so those were things that were instilled in me from the very beginning, and I think definitely have influenced me and and my children. Um, in terms of higher education. Well, that's that's really fascinating. That desire to, you know, keep going and to keep learning uh, is really powerful, and it obviously made an impact on you. and And uh, you you chose psychology as your undergrad uh, degree. Were there other uh, things you were considering? You mentioned you were involved in math and science early on in yeah. in high school. So how did the Absolutely. how did the psychology degree come about versus something like engineering or math or another field? Sure. I've always been fascinated with psychology and how people um, think and behave and 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 work. But um, I also got advice um, from my family that you can't do anything with a uh, a bachelor's degree in psychology and you you really can't live off of that. So I initially started my undergraduate as sort of a pre-health track and I wanted to be a veterinarian. Always have loved animals and wanted to do that work. And so I think a couple of things uh, made me pivot (laughs) to psychology. Um, One was I had an experience doing work with Um, the animal resources there at Emory. So the group that was responsible for managing and taking care of all the animals um, that might have been associated with the university. So I got a chance to shadow and work with um, veterinarians. And in that experience, kind of got their advice of, you probably don't want to be a veterinarian. So they were not very excited about it. And so I said, okay. Um, But I think the other thing, coming back to my earlier comment, I think the other thing was um, as I transitioned from high school and then into college um, and started to really um, deal with my own response to my father's um, death, um, it really dawned on me that there wasn't, you know, any real outlet for myself or my family family to address that grief and address that loss. Um, So for me, um, even though my father had that high expectation around education, really valued it, he never saw me graduate from high school, from college, from graduate program, never. And so it was in probably that that start of the second year where I took some, you know, psychology classes and and I remembered my first love. And so I pivoted back um, with a primary focus on I wanted, if there were people out there that were having difficulties, I wanted them to have a provider that looked like them. Um, And so I did not see that. And, and so that was one of the areas that I thought I could contribute by, you know, focusing on psychology and then eventually going on to get my license as a psychologist. Well, yeah. So, so, so the, I guess the psychology bug got you and, and you realized something that was value, not only to helping you kind of deal with the grief of, of losing your father, but, and learning how to translate that into helping others, I guess, and also having representation in the field of psychology of people that look like you. And um, so that's really powerful. But at the time, you know, I heard a lot of feedback, oh, how difficult it is to get into, um, you know, PhD programs, how competitive it is. You've got to be perfect, basically, in order to do that. And so, um, you know, had a little bit of imposter syndrome, if you will, you know, is this something that I could do? And so I looked around and actually started a terminal master's program first to sort of try it out. And then, you know, realized that there was no 
reason why I couldn't be successful. And so I did, you know, apply to graduate programs and and focused in on counseling psychology specifically because I wanted to have more individuals that are available to address more of the day-to-day kinds of issues that people come up with. Um, certainly had enough psychology classes to understand the, the, the psychopathology piece of it and, and really, you know, enjoyed that, but I really wanted to make sure that the vast majority of people had someone to address sort of those daily issues. And the program I chose at Georgia State was was really perfect because the um, the curriculum actually was very much blended with the clinical psychology program. So at least a third, if not more, of our courses were the same. Um, we interacted there. So I felt like I had a great foundation in um, clinical and psychopathology, um, but also had the fundamentals about how how you uh, deal with um, everyday adjustments. And, and, and the other thing that that program had was a focus on multicultural counseling um, and how do you interact with different cultures and backgrounds. And so it was a perfect fit for me. I read, you know, some of the work, you the earlier publications, actually, it's, it's funny because some of the people that you were working with at the time, I was actually working with as well. So we, Ken Resnikow and... Um, you know, Marcy Campbell, uh, you had done yeah. some early work with them on some of their church-based uh, interventions. How, how did uh, working on some of those projects help you kind of tr- decide, yeah. you know, what the next step was? SBM has had a major impact on my career. And so it, it's funny that you mentioned Ken Resnikow. So when I was finishing up my postdoctoral fellowship, I had a connection through one of my graduate program who had talked about him and his work in Black churches. And that was really resonating with me. So I did a cold, a cold email, you know, just saying, hey, you know, love to meet with you um, and was astonished that probably the same day or within 24 hours, I got a response back saying, hey, I'd love to meet with you. Come meet with me. And it was the same week. Bring your CV. Um, so essentially, I went in. I met Ken Resnikow for the first time and I walked out of that meeting with a job offer. <laughs> so it was not intentional. But my good fortune was he had just got funded um, a new research project that was focused on um, doing obesity prevention in black churches he was looking for someone to bring on board to help with that. And and really the rest is history in terms of my um, introduction to public health. Had never heard of it before, um, but it really was a nice blend between my interest now in health psychology, my focus on counseling psychology, and my interest around addressing minority health and, and health disparities. Those things fit very nicely. And, and so that's where I ended up starting with Ken and then with Marcy and and the work that they were doing um, and, and sort of obesity, weight management, cancer prevention. Yeah. Really love the early work on uh, obesity prevention and in black churches and the sort of body and soul program that that became. Um, and, and um, you know, the other thing you mentioned is, you know, not being um, intimidated about reaching out to people, right? Early on in your career and sort of just getting a meeting and saying, you know, I'm doing research or you're, I like what you're doing. Uh, so, so important to do that. You must have then got sort of more interested in public health because at, shortly after that, you, you went on to a, a teach in the uh, School of Public Health and take a faculty position at Birmingham, University of Alabama, Birmingham. Um, so what was that um, move like for you? at that time in your life. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, that transition was not necessarily intentional either. Um, So at some point, um, you know, Ken decided to go on sabbatical and I, my, you know, sort of the, the hairs on the back of my neck stood up and I was like, wait a minute. Um, so he was going on a sabbatical to Michigan and let's just say 20 plus years later, he's still there. <laughs> right. um, so, um, so when that happened, I started to look around and again, I was quite fortunate to have some opportunities to, um, to explore in terms of where I would land next and had a great foundation, I think, both in terms of my training and the things I was able to learn from Ken and others um, in public health. And so I I interviewed um, a number of places, including the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And another thing that just happened to happen, you know, was that there was a flyer about my job talk that was apparently in um, the elevator. And another longtime SBM member, Dr. David Allison, happened to see the flyer and recognized that I was not on 
um, uh, that he was not on my itinerary to meet with when I came through. So he actually called the people who were over the search committee and and got himself on my committee on my um, itinerary. We went out to breakfast. I remember very distinctly that morning. And and he opened my eyes to the possibilities that were there. He was leading the Nutrition and Obesity Research Center, really trying to grow and bring more um, junior faculty on board. And and really, you know, I got excited about, you know, UAB and, and ultimately decided um, to go into that, that position. And you spent, I think, 20, almost 20 years at UAB. <laughs> yeah. So you must have... Liked it. You must have been. You must have been advancing through the, through your uh, career trajectory there, and you had a great experience uh, as a faculty there. What were some of the things that you enjoyed? as you were developing? Starting off in, in the School of Public Health really had this great idea about how, you know, you'd have this balance between doing research, um, doing, you know, teaching, and also public health service. And that was one of the reasons why that was the position that I selected over some other options, because I liked that balance. It also allowed me to be true to what was growing as a budding community-engaged researcher, um, to be able to do that work and really enjoyed it. Um, you know, for a significant period of time there. But I think there was also a shift that was starting to happen, um, probably in many schools of public health across the country, but certainly at that time, that was my perception at that institution where it was getting a little bit out of balance in terms of what my interests were and, and you know, less so about the, um, the service activities that I was interested in, the community engagement. And so, so actually, while I was at UAB that, that, long length of time, I actually made a transition after um, moving from assistant to associate. I moved over from public health to medicine. And actually now the vast majority of my career has actually been in medicine. And so that transition was because I was also sort of transitioning from my own research questions and things that were, that I was, um, you know, focused on. A lot of it like most of us traditionally have been taught, you know, behavioral science, behavioral medicine is really about getting individual behavior change. But around that same time, I was really recognizing that it was, um, you know, really relevant to look at the things outside of individuals that were making it more difficult for people to do the right thing, if you will. And so I was starting to pivot into what are these structural and social um, and built environment factors that were really making it difficult even if people knew what they needed to do for that. And that also came at a time where while I my my research never specifically focused on cancer until that point, it was another um, pivotal time in which the cancer center leadership at the university were uh, started to reach out because there was a focus on increasing the diversity in biomedical research, and there were supplements that were made available to cancer centers and others to try to diversify that. And so the leadership really reached out um, to me to say, hey, would you be interested in doing a supplement project to their existing academic community partnership? Um, and and I'll say that it, it took me a little bit of time to say yes. Um, while I don't think it was intentional that I never really focused on cancer as a research, I do think that in the back of my mind, that was also part of my long-term grieving process to to not focus in on that area. But it also, the timing was perfect because that not only did I have that previous loss of my father, but I had just lost um, a maternal aunt that was very close to, um, that I was very close with and to breast cancer. And so, you know, I thought about colorectal cancer, breast cancer. These are, these are ca colorectal cancers for sure, absolutely can be prevented. Breast cancer, early detection, absolutely has great outcomes. And here are two people in my life. These were not, in, these are people with high education, um, you know, good income, great insurance, all the things that you would think would not be associated with um, death from preventable, you know, types of conditions, but still there was something there that made both of them uh, pass away, you know, very early in life. And so I did 
go ahead and make that pivot. Pivot. I said yes to the Cancer Center director. I got a supplement project working with the Deep South Network for Cancer Control, which had been a great partnership where um, it really was putting community-based participatory research into action. And, and because of that, in the work that I was doing, there was a lot more colleagues that were in the School of Medicine and in the division that I ended up moving into that were doing that work. So it was a natural transition to move um, there in which you know, I was there until, you know, the end of my, my term at UAB. Wow. That's really interesting. So kind of, you went from this work that you were doing in obesity, um, more focused on, I mean, there were some aspects of community based research there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, working with black churches and working, um, in communities, what, what is it about community based participatory research that you like? And, and what is it that makes that successful? I mean, it, it certainly has been a, a transition for me to really appreciate the difference between doing research in communities and doing research with communities. And so the uh, the CBPR, community-based participatory research model, is one in which communities that you are wanting to target for your interventions are active participants from if, you know, helping you to design the re or ask the research question and pose that question all the way through dissemination of that, um, whatever the findings are. And so for me, we're talking about, I mean, behavior change is so difficult to do. And there are so many complexities. And I have no illusions that I have the answers to even a fraction of it. So for me, community-based participatory research is really a way to bring in the variety of perspectives to tackle these wicked problems, if you will. And, and really, you know, what I understand is that, you know, it's helpful to design programs, interventions that are going to be well received by the audience you are targeting. And what better way to do that than to have them co-design it with you? And that's what the CBPR has been for me, to really acknowledge the community expertise, um, to really put it on the level playing field where, where we're sharing budgets, we're sharing decision making, and we're trying to level the power um, so that it's not just one side it, meaning the academic side. Um, and with that, I think it has led to, um, you know, discovering new parts of, of programs that might be more successful. Um, I think it, it is definitely difficult. I mean, what I will say for sure, in terms of some of the challenges in my career, so for example, you know, trying to convince promotion and tenure committees that what I was doing early on was research and not service. Um, I think that certainly was the case with doing CBPR work. Um, it takes longer to build those relationships if they're authentic. Um, that means that the publications, the grants are going to be a little bit longer. And if you don't have a leadership that really values and appreciates that, it's very easy for someone to say you're not being successful, you're not meeting metrics. So I think I've learned quite a bit over time, but ultimately I think the success to doing CBPR or any kind of community engaged research is, you know, you know, being authentic, um, really having that true partnership, the shared decision making, the shared budgets and resources, um, and, and really the respect for the community partner or partners um, to have expertise that you are lacking and that you nearly need. It's so gratifying to to work with, you know, community members who have come to you as a, as an academic and as a researcher and to be able to, you know, do the work that matters to them, right? And to do the work that 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 they feel is going to help their community, rather than you coming in and saying this is going to this is going to help you. And I think that uh, the having the right team members in your work, how have you figured out how to uh, build successful teams? Yeah, I think you know ultimately, as I mentioned before, I mean these are complex issues, especially once I started, you know appreciating that it's much more beyond the individual that, you know, again, sort of thinking at it from a psychosocial, you know, uh, psycho, uh, social ecological model, you know, we really know that, you know, at the individual level, that's just one small piece of it. So with that in mind, I've 
always benefited from having multidisciplinary teams. So people outside of psychology, outside of public health, um, to blend their perspectives on how we can tackle these issues. And, and that's also, I think, part of my own personal career success of having people so broadly across the um, academic institutions and even the nonprofit sectors. I've you know worked with those um, groups as well. I think that's been very beneficial. Um, ultimately, it's, it's like any great leadership you find what the common goal is, and then you build on that. Um, and then you also are not insisting that everybody kind of gel together. You really do respect the diversity and you use that diversity to your advantage um, by not trying to just have everybody have group think or come to one agreement, but really, you know, take a, a step and kind of um, test out all kinds of different models. But that team science approach is something that is ultimately beneficial to me um, and, and something I think has been very rewarding um, as I've, I've been able to advance in my career. Yeah, that's, that's, I've heard so many people talk about that and the importance of that team science and multidisciplinary teams as being re- important in developing this innovative science and, and, and addressing the complex problems. I know you, you've been a, an academic leader. You're a leader at your institution. You're a leader uh, nationally. You were president of SBM, so you have, and also, but you've also actually got involved in learning about leadership skill development. What did you learn about leadership as you've developed through your career? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a definitely a, a very important question, and it's one that I you know really think through quite often, um, especially. Um, more lately, as we have seen, unfortunately, lots of um, news of of many Black women, in particular, who've been in leadership roles um, and have had have been challenged by that. So, whether or not it's um, you know forced or pressured resignations from leadership positions, whether or not it's um, you know death by suicide or threats of losing those positions. Um, this is this is something that's very difficult. Um, I, I'm very proud that there have been spaces where I've um, been the first in the room, but but many of those spaces. Um, it, it, that shouldn't have been the case. Um, I, I'm, I, I should not have been in those spaces, uh, and so I take that. Uh, I take those opportunities where I am in the room, whether or not it's the first or the only or one of very few, I take those very seriously. And I know that there's a tremendous responsibility um, to being in those spaces. Um, There have certainly been many times, um, probably even a couple hours before this podcast is being recorded, where I question, you know, is this really worth it? The physical and mental health toll that it takes um, to be a leader in spaces that were not created for people like me. Um, that That's a daily battle um, that I certainly face within myself. Um, but I think you know, for me as a leader, there are certain characteristics that I look for and admire in other leaders, and I hope that I am displaying. Um, you know, one of them is certainly first and foremost just integrity. Um, I hope that people that are um, in my sphere of influence will see me as someone who has a high degree of integrity. That you know. My word is my word. If if there's something that I can't do, I will come back and let you know that I can't do that. But that's really important to me. I also think that as a leader, um, you also have to have a great deal of humility, um, recognizing that you're in a role for a period of time um, and that it is something that is in service to others and that... um, you need to be respectful of that. And so I think humility, recognizing that you're not entitled to be in that role is really important as a leader. And then um, I think obviously vision, you know, I think that's really important to to talk about where we are right now, but then to envision a future, even though things may not be exactly where you want them, envision it to look closer to the ideal. And then lastly, it's about being action oriented. Um, One of the things that frustrates me quite a bit is when you have a leader that's not not willing to make a decision, um, delays that or is focused so much on the process that nothing gets done. And so those are things that are really 
important to me around leadership. And yes, I've been a part of multiple leadership programs to better understand myself, my leadership style. Um, You know, all of those things are really, really important. But when it comes down to it, it's really those personal values that I think keep me motivated and keep me grounded in, in leadership roles. Yeah. I think it's really important to go through those leadership uh, courses and, and develop as a leader as you move through the field. Like you mentioned, um, you know, being able to create vision, being able to make decisions, those are all really key. Uh, and, 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 and helping others to uh, share in your vision uh, and, and finding out like how, as a team, you can move things forward. And, you know, something you mentioned uh, really uh, kind of resonated a little bit with me about how you shouldn't feel like you're, you're the only one in, in that space. You know, I'm Hispanic and I've been in that kind of a space before where I feel like I'm the only person in that space. What are some of the challenges that our institutions have with, with what are some of the challenges that they've had in, in promoting people to be leaders from diverse backgrounds? You know, it's not a lack of potential highly talented people who are hardworking, but what are the challenges that our institutions sometimes have? Sure. So we probably need a whole separate podcast on this, <laughs> um, but the, the brief version, I think, is um, first and foremost, again, it, many of these systems were not not created um, for people that look like you or I, um, honestly. They, they really were to perpetuate a certain uh, phenotype of who a leader is. And so I say that in the broadest of terms, not only about um, uh, gender, not only about race and ethnicity, but it's also in terms of, you know, what gets value in particularly academic settings. Um, you know, some of the things that 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 I've talked about in terms of my career, the community engagement, being able to have partnerships and so forth. Um, the currency may not be thought of the same for that type of work versus, um, you know, uh, publications, numbers, bean counting kind of things, the number of dollars that you bring in. And so if you have any individual that sort of defers a little bit from that stereotypical, you know, what you view as a leader, then it becomes more difficult. But the cure to that really is it's interesting because it is the more diversity that you get in and you see people in different perspectives that you really get the cure to the lack of that. But I think that's a major part of the challenge with leadership is that um, there's a certain phenotype that's really expected. And when you don't fit that mold, then it's hard for some to see you as, quote unquote, a leader. I think the other thing is to your your very point, the, the fact of the matter is there has been tremendous progress. There have been an increased number of people that look like you and I um, and others who are out there. Um, but if your sphere of your social network looks just like you, then you don't know where to find those people. And so it means that you have to be intentional to look for where you have that diversity, where you have perspectives that are different. People who may not have gone to your academic institution, they went to someplace else. People that are not from your region of the country, they're from a different perspective. So if you really value that, you're going to be intentional about where you go out and promote. And then I think the other thing that I've experienced Um, in my career is some people may do a really great job of recruitment. And so they recruit in a lot of diversity, but the problem is the retention and to your point of how do we get people into leadership? There is a, an extracurriculum or rule book that many of us don't have privy, you know, to it because we don't have the long line of family members and close networks of folks who have been in there. And so I think that's part of the other issue is how do we better socialize people who may be the first, the only, those types of things to understand the other pieces that aren't said out loud that let you to um, to be perceived of as leadership potential or on the short list when people are looking for leaders. Yeah. So important. And I think what you mentioned, I like what you mentioned, that that creating the diversity is the cure, but also what you're saying in the subtext, and I'm hearing, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's also the inclusiveness, right? It's sort of making people, creating an environment where people from different 
backgrounds feel included, not just recruiting more people from different backgrounds, but making sure that right. they're, they're included and their voices are heard and their perspectives and their differences are part of the zeitgeist and dialogue of the culture. <laughs> so that's really, yeah. really cool. And you, you, I think, uh, more than anybody that I know as uh, your legacy uh, and, and the work that you've done and the continue to do is, is uh, in the space of diversity, equity, and inclusion. And I know that you have a leadership role at your own institution in that area. What do you think is important about DEI and, and advancing DEI? So first and foremost, it's personal. Um, it's what I mentioned before. You know, even my uh, early direction or redirection into psychology was because I looked and I did not see people that looked like me that were accessible to me and my family in, in addressing a major issue in our family. So I really believe that that is going to be important and critical to um, to addressing and making sure there's representation. And there's been a lot of attention towards that in terms of our science, for example, and ensuring that there's representation in clinical trials and so forth. So I think, um, you know, having a, a, a real commitment to addressing that is critical um, to the workforce. I think it's critical to our science um, to make sure that those with different backgrounds are, again, are available at the table to help us address some of the very challenging, complex issues that are behavioral medicine, behavioral science. That's really critical. Um, I stay in it um, probably because of another SBM member, a long-term member. Um, I remember one point in particular where I was going to step out of my academic career and just do something different. And it was um, a really important conversation I had with Dr. Shariki Kumiika, who really, you know, with love and guilt, um, helped me to understand the platform that I had at the time and that I would continue to have if I stayed into leadership roles to really push back uh, on some of the um, beliefs and practices that were in place that are keeping us from advancing the principles of diversity, equity, and inclusion. To be the voice in that room for people who might not be able, may not have been invited into the room or may not feel comfortable speaking up. So especially as I've advanced in more seniority, um, I take it, part of that responsibility I mentioned before, I take it upon myself to make sure that I don't leave rooms uh, without expressing what I think is problematic to us at advancing um, in this space of, of DEI. And it's not for political correctness, if you will. I really talk about it as being critical to, um, to us advancing innovation, discovery. You don't get discovery by doing the same things over and over again. Um, and if we're only thinking about the way our experience is, we don't bring in that diverse perspectives. We are not inclusive. And so I speak to it, you know, in that respect, how important it is. So I think, you know, DEI, my commitment to it, whether or not I have a formal title in it or not, is really about making sure that the workforce is representative, um, that my children who are coming up now see people that look like them in a variety of different spaces. It's also important that those diverse perspectives are at the table to help us to to deal with some of these challenges. Um, so I think all of those things are really critical. And, and I recognize, um, trust me, I spent, you know, a good deal of my career in the Deep South, I've made a transition now a little bit more north. Um, there are lots of perspectives everywhere you go. And so how you talk about it might need to change a little bit. But if you hold on to those core principles that um, having different perspectives, bringing them together are really valuable to advancing science and to advancing um, and making sure that everyone has access to that, then I think that's how you stay in the game. Yeah, I think we can't give up. We have to keep going forward and we, we have to continue to, um, you know, as you said, if we're going to be able to better our science and better the health and behavioral sciences, you need that diversity. Otherwise, we don't have people looking into um, issues that that are addressing some of the areas where we need the most help. And so having that diversity of of, of of experience and, and, and life experience is really important to our field, as you mentioned. You've been a, a, a member of SBM many years and actually have a, had a great influence on it. What are some of the things that you 
mentioned you've mentioned a few, and I can probably rattle them off. But I want to hear from you. What are the things that you've liked most about SBM, and why this is a professional home for you? Yeah, I mean, so SBM definitely is number one. That, that that's home. I'm I'm always going to be there um, in support of SBM in whatever ways I can. Um, and it probably was about you know a quarter century ago, or so to speak, when I first got introduced to SBM, and have been committed. I think a couple of things are really why um, it's at the center of my heart. So I think it's. Great science, absolutely. Um, great science focused on behavioral um, medicine and, and, and you know, how we can advance the field um, it is really critical. SBM is also about not just doing great science, but translating that great science into, um, into practice. Um, so whether or not that's practice in terms of policy, practice in terms of, um, you know, behavioral medicine, in terms of other, you know, public health. I think that transition is really important to me because as I mentioned earlier, you know, really it's about, you know, actionable strategies. How can you um, not just have the great science that's on your CV, um, but how you use that great science to improve the health of, uh, of everyone. And so that's really important to me. It's also a place where, um, and I know being on the board a couple of different times, we struggle with, you know, the size of the organization. Is it too small, too big? You know, I'm still kind of, um, you know, like Goldilocks, I think it's just right, you know, <laughs> you know, right now. And so it's a, it's a just right size where um, you can reach out and really interact with people. Very People are very open, you know, to connect. Um, it's not so huge where you feel like you're just lost and you don't know how to reach out to people. It's also a perfect size in terms of those who are interested in leadership, whether or not it's a formal leadership title, meaning you're applying to one of our, you know, elected positions or you're, you know, expressing yourself in one of our, um, you know, one of our SIGs or some of the other kinds of committees, you know, I think there's a great way for you to get actively involved in SBM. And of all the places that I'm members of, you know, I, I've not found any other organization quite like SBM. I've really enjoyed our conversation. And thanks so much for, you know, sharing your insights and speaking from the heart and telling us a little bit about your journey. Um, just to close us out, I guess my last set of questions are things that I've asked several other guests. And what advice would you give to more mid-career people? Yeah. So you're really, you know, asking a question that nobody's really asked. <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, they, they didn't ask me. And I don't even know that I, the young Monica Baskin, would even listen. <laughs> but um, my advice is actually not different depending on those stage, stages that you just mentioned. It, it's the same at each one of them. I mean, how you apply it will certainly be different um, based on if you're early, mid, or late career. And that advice is to keep going, keep learning, keep fighting. Um, that, you know, there will be times that you are going to want to give up. Um, but I'd encourage you to keep going. Um, it does get better. Um, and, 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 and really move on, um, where, regardless of where you are and that piece, it, piece of about learning. I mean, you certainly have heard it probably in many of my responses already in the podcast. Um, I, I consider myself to be a lifelong learner. I don't, I can't imagine that there'll ever be a time when I can't learn something. So whether or not that's formal education or learning from community members. Um, and so that's that's part of the discovery for me. That's part of the excitement of um, who I am and what I do, especially in, in, a, in my science is, you know, trying to figure out a answer to a question that I don't know the answer to. Um, I think that's important. And fighting really comes from more of our conversation about some of the challenges and, and failures and disappointments not only in my career, but as I see others, and especially with that lens of being a Black woman who's a counseling psychologist in medicine, um, you know, really constantly trying to, you know, fight stereotypes or dismantle, um, you know, certain things that are in place that are making it more difficult for people who have backgrounds that are different than maybe what is expected to get ahead and advance. Um, the other thing I would just say generally is just don't 
go it alone. Um, you know, for those of you who might have been um, um, witness to my presidential um, presentation, I really one of the last slides I had up was to thank and honor what I call my board of direction board of directors. And these are people along my career path that have been very instrumental. Um, they include peers, so people who started off with me as very early junior people, not knowing what in the world we're getting into. Um, and we've all aged nicely together. Um, but it also includes people who've been one or two steps ahead or three or four steps ahead of where I want it to be. And so recognizing that this work is difficult, um, I think it is I perceive it for myself to be even more difficult being from an underrepresented population, a marginalized population. And so getting that support um, uh, from that group of mentors or peers um, is really critical to staying in the game and staying as healthy as possible. So that's my two cents um, for those who uh, want to take a listen to it. Um, but but it's a fabulous, uh, you know, I certainly have had a fabulous career so far. Um, um, and and certainly would encourage others to reach out um, to make that cold call to people that you think you don't necessarily would give you the time of day. You'd be very surprised. Um, many of us do have a servant's heart. And so we'll give you, you know, a, a few minutes of our time. Um, definitely come to the annual meetings. That's another great place where people are able to grab for coffee or just to go and have a chit chat um, to learn more about the field, to be supportive. Um, um, those are the things that I would encourage everyone at all career stages to think about. And that brings us to the end of another insightful episode of SBM's Buzz and Behavioral Medicine. Huge thanks to Dr. Baskin for sharing her journey and wisdom with us today. Be sure to check out the show notes for links to Dr. Baskin's articles and relevant SBM resources. As we reflect on the conversations and anticipate the future of behavioral medicine, remember it's our collective drive, passion, and curiosity that will shape the course of the future of behavioral medicine. I'm Dr. Bernard Femler, reminding you that behavioral minds matter. Keep doing the good science you do and the science that does good. Remember to like, follow, subscribe to receive notifications.